Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Michael Bajant. He is the co-author of the blockbuster book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. He is the author of The Jesus Papers, exposing the greatest cover-up in history. He has also written The Messianic Legacy, The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception, The Temple and the Lodge, Secret Germany, The Elixir and the Stone. It goes on and on, ladies and gentlemen. But today we're going to tackle a very complex and delicate subject, and that is the real question of Jesus Christ, of Christianity, of Judaism, and some of the research and discoveries that Michael has made and put together into a synthesis of maybe a new story about religion and spirituality. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Michael Bajant to its rainmaking time. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon, Kim. Well, the first thing I want to say after reading your book is that if we were alive at the time of the Inquisition, you would be burned at the stake, correct? Well, I hope so. I mean, if, if, I, if I wasn't, then I would have failed. I've uh, gone for it because uh, my underlying argument, I suppose, is that what we believe is rather important because what we believe affects how we act. And if we have crazy beliefs, uh, it'll make us do crazy things and cause crazy political outcomes, crazy social outcomes. So be careful with what you believe. It might come true. I think there's a distinction you make that's very clear between the mystery societies and the religious dogma societies or the Vatican and having spiritual beliefs. And I think throughout the entire book, you keep reminding the reader that Jewish people did not kill Jesus, that the Romans killed Jesus, and that we really should be at war with the Vatican and what's happening with the Vatican. Am I incorrect in saying that? Well, uh, no, not really. I, I mean, what happened with the Vatican was that they, they took over what was a much broader, uh, widely based movement. I mean, for example... Most of the texts, which later became part of the New Testament, were just a selection of equally valid texts available in the second century AD. There were uh, Gospels for Mary, for example, the Gospel of Thomas. There was quite a few other texts, but the Rome-oriented theologians went to a lot of effort to on the one hand, restrict the role of women in the church, and secondly, to uh, push the primacy of Rome in terms of creating the theology. You see, originally, Rome wasn't primal. You had the theological schools in Rome, in Alexandria, in, in uh, Antioch, Constantinople. They were all equal. They were all slightly different. But Rome decided it wanted to rule, and it went out of its way to do it. And that's why now we have a situation where there's these arguments all through Christendom about, for example, the role of women in the church. Can women be bishops? Can women be priests? I mean, there's complete nonsense. In the second century, women were fulfilling all these roles. It's simply the Rome attitude or their own central attitude that we're up against. I think in the book you said there were two guys that got together and created the paradigm in which women were to be suspect, their involvement in anything related to religion. Well, there were more than two, but there were some uh, prominent people. I mean, there was uh, uh, Tertullian, for example, Hippolytus, uh, Irenaeus. These were mid to late second century AD pro-Rome theologians, and they obviously hated women. There's no question uh, if, you, if you actually read what they wrote, these people are um, uh, misogynist to, to the extreme. And they won out. They produced the, what then became the orthodoxy. And you see, one of the great lies 
that has been perpetrated is that the church has been uh, guided by God that through this morass or this range of materials, the materials which won out through the efforts of these particular theologians, that they won out because God was behind it. Therefore, it gives a divine sanction to this particular perspective, which is complete and utter nonsense. I mean, we have to just realize the spin which has been placed upon these original texts is horrendous and wide-ranging and comprehensive. And this is one of the things I go through in my book, particularly the Jesus Papers. I go through the spin, because uh, most of us don't realize how much of it there is, frankly. I am not a theologian. I am not an expert or well-read in the Old or the New Testament. And so I'm not really in a perspective with grounded facts about what is said and what the current spin is. But I have a question about Constantine. Do you agree that Constantine did change a lot of the Bible as we know it? That he changed a lot. That he changed it. In other words, it was translated different than either Aramaic or in Hebrew. This is a, I, I, I don't have any proof one way or the other, but let's put the thing another way. Okay. Constantine and his theologians, uh, particularly Eusebius, were behind a particular spin on the texts. And once they had created this spin, mysteriously, the texts seemed to reflect it. And the main spin they, they were behind was making Christendom accept the fact that Jesus was divine. I mean, this was the whole point of the Council of Nicaea uh, in 325 AD. Effectively, by a vote of around about 217 to 3, they voted Jesus to be God. And mysteriously, theology came to reflect this quite quickly. Now, there's no set document which we can point at and say that Constantine changed this, but the effect is obvious, and we can see what he's doing. And we can also see that he's putting Christianity in the service of Roman politics. So the whole thing changes. It, it, it becomes, again, pro-Roman and in support of the Roman state, which is a big difference from what was originally a, a Jewish messianic movement. From all that you have written and read and researched, can you give your presentation of the context and paradigm in which you are viewing who Jesus was in terms of factual history at this time? It's very difficult to prove who Jesus was in history. We only have uh, two statements from Roman historians who had no particular axe to grind. One said uh, there's Tacitus and there's uh, Pliny the Younger. One says that a Jewish Messiah was crucified in the time of Pontius Pilate during the time of the Emperor Tiberius. The other uh, had some Christians come into his court because he was governor of part of Turkey, or part of what is now modern Turkey. Uh, and he did some research and found that this movement traced itself back to this Jewish Messiah. We don't know what his name was. Uh, Jesus may not be his name because Jesus is Yeshua, which simply means the deliverer, which could be a title rather than a name. Um, we don't really know anything for sure about his life because the New Testament is theology, it's not history. Um, obviously, there's going to be elements of history in there, but it's very, very difficult to tease them out. I mean, one of the great, uh, what can I, how can I put it, one of the great uh, collusions, I suppose, that everyone engages in, even myself, uh, because there's no way out of it, is that we tend to treat much of the New Testament as history simply because if we didn't, there wouldn't be anything to talk about. 